Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig, Allied Partners. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M. N. T. Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Meriden Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sheldrake Organization, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Triangle Services, Whitkoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stoll, host of Building New York. You know, I've done about 48 shows, and I said, you know, who are builders of New York? You know, they, they, they build buildings, they do other things, but probably one of the biggest builders of New York's is the healthcare system in New York. And today I've, I've really brought someone who is a true mensch, as we would say, a guy who is the, empl who is the president and CEO of the the largest healthcare system in New York, the largest hospital in New York, the largest number employee next to the city of New York with 16,000, Dr. Herbert Pardis. Nice to be here with you, Mike. Pleasure. So, I mean, at, at this time in your life, you know, you, you said you were born in the Bronx, and at the age of one, your father, who is a, a creative accountant, let's say, a very creative accountant, moves to Lakewood, New Jersey. To do what? He, he went there to run a hotel, which was a popular setting, Lakewood, in as much as there was no air travel in those days. There was no Florida, there was no Caribbean. So people went out for what was supposed to be uh, six degrees warmer weather, great food, um, the ability to sit on a porch and give yourself a, a good suntan, uh, card games, uh, Catskill humor, uh, and even they got to the point of, at one point, opening up ice skating. They had um, uh, horse-drawn sleighs in which people would go around the beautiful lake in the center. So it was a little paradise. And, and young Herb, being one of three children, uh, becomes the entrepreneur, um, concessionaire, uh, waiter. What else? Busboy, children's dining room waiter, head waiter, every job, bellhop, every job in the um, hotel, uh, my father was happy to give me. He, he, and it was, it, was a, it was a mutual, we were on the same side on this, because I liked the opportunity to take a job, uh, to make so some money. It was money. a good way to mingle, to Abs uh, oh, great, absolutely. great practice, you know, development, absolutely. dealing with people right. with all different types, you know, make sure that they had enough uh, sour cream on, uh, you know, the, the blintzes and all the rest, right? Yeah. My favorite line is when you go over to a Catskill customer and you say, we have roast beef, chicken, turkey, steak, whatever, and the, pay, the person says, I'll take it. And that was, that was characterized. They ate like the cows were, were coming home. It, it, it was... 
a while. And after they finished, they, they took a napkin, rolled up stuff for the night. God forbid they should get hungry. They, they it's, can it's, eat it's, it's like last week, I think I noticed in the Wall Street Journal or something, they said rascals in Florida closed, you know. Right. And, and people used to pick up the rolls and everything else. So, so, so Pardis over here at that time has no idea he's going to get involved with health care, especially right. going to be the, the head of the, the New York Presbyterian health care system in the hospital. But you, you said during the, the Lakewood was more of the the winters right. and in the summers you went to Mount Freedom or the Catskills or, or the Jersey Shore my father who owned the hotel in, in Lakewood would partner for the summer with a somebody who owned a hotel which was a summer resort and they would, they would try to uh, induce his clientele to come there and so he'd get into negotiations for with the family for four weeks and negotiating weekends and how many times the father would come out and they'd make a deal. And that was the way my father brought business to the man or family or so that was running the summer hotel. So at 18 years of age, the, the, the hotel entrepreneur leaves Lakewood and, and goes up to New Brunswick. And, and at this time you said there was always that relative or the, the peer that you want to become, you know, the physician or the doctor. You, your mother had a relative who was a dentist? Right. And did, how do you decide when you went, you, you said to me, when you went to Rutgers, uh, which was the state university, uh, you had a decision that you really knew you wanted to get involved with healthcare and medicine. What made that? What was the... I think in those days medicine was an absolutely revered uh, profession. Um, you could help people. Um, you learned, and learning always was appealing. And uh, come down to it, there are a lot of professions that are lively today which were unknown in those days. My, I wasn't interested in business. I, I don't know what got it into me, but I couldn't imagine doing anything unless you're doing something good to help. That was just, and I'm not sure even where it was instilled. Maybe, you, you know, without my father telling me, he was an example of it because he had me out there at age six, seven, eight with my sister who was three years younger uh, raising money from the guests in the hotel when we were kids for all kinds of good causes. And uh, I saw my father as uh, always serving other people. I mean, one of the f interesting things is that when we went, in, we used to eat in the hotel uh, kitchen. And when we went in to eat, this was the family, you always had to wait to see what was left after the guests ordered whatever they wanted. So the notion that you were there to serve or to, uh, you, you took second priority in terms of your own immediate needs, uh, just was natural. It was, there was nothing even to discuss. And my father was the consummate administrator. He could do everything, which I never uh, mastered. He, I could never get uh, the, um, the plumbing, electrical skills, et cetera, so, down. So how does the Lakewood boy who's up in New Brunswick, who works one summer uh, for Ballantyne Beer on the conveyor belt and right. some other jobs, get to Downstate Medical Center, which is the State University of New York, Downstate. How do you get there? Well, first of all, there were no medical schools in New Jersey. Second, I was accepted to Downstate after three years. At first, I wanted to go early and get out of college and go into medicine. But I reconsidered it in my uh, as I was getting ready to go because I thought I had made a mistake and taken too much science. I wanted to stay at Rutgers for another year, and I took music and sociology and art, which was a very good decision. But then I felt obliged, because Downstate was very good about it. They were very uh, reasonable, They and I said I felt I was obligated since I uh, turned, but turned down an offer they made me to go there. So I went to New York, and New York was not uh, foreign to me. I dealt with New Yorkers. My grandmother lived in New York. My aunt and uncle lived in yeah, New York. Downstate was a different, it was a foreign neighborhood. I mean, it was a very rustic um, urban neighborhood, one I might would say. I would say Downstate was, uh, well, it was a neighborhood that changed over the period of time I was there. I was there for 19 years, and it changed over those years. It was a very lively, it, 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 the medical school had no heirs. It was very down to earth. There were a lot of very nice people. This was not the most distinguished medical school in the uh, in the country, but it was a very fine medical school with a lot of outstanding people so there. How, you know, you said when you went to Downstate, you know, when you you have no idea, but originally you wanted to do internal medicine. 
Right. And you had a mentor, you right. know, uh, Dr. Doc. You got it. And he, but how, how do you change from internal medicine to psychiatry? Well, Bill Doc. I mean, I, I think I, I became the psychiatrist on this show, but, you know. <laughs> I love Bill Doc because Bill Doc was one of the finest diagnosticians I've ever seen. And I just marveled at his ability to figure out complex medical situations. But when I went to the outpatient department in medicine, I found that 60, 70 percent of the patients who came in came in with basically psychiatric problems. And the downstate psychiatric faculty was very good. And, they, and it was very interesting to learn about behavior. And so that just intrigued me. And the other thing I liked about it was it was, seemed like a feel where you were always learning. It, 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 while there are other people who are masters at taking one project, one kind of intervention and doing it repeatedly, uh, I couldn't do that. I liked the idea that uh, the psychiatry seems so diverse and encompassed so much. So, so you finish downstate and you continue. You love, you like Brooklyn so much. You continue and you go to Kings County, right, uh, where you do your first year of residency in uh, internal medicine, uh, and then another year. Then you get drafted. I go to the army uh, in 1962. Uh, I was there for two years at Fort Myer they, as, a, as, as a person with one year psychiatric training which is not entirely unusual in the Army. They put me in charge of the mental hygiene program at Fort Myer, which was right next to the Pentagon. So I was involved with every psychiatric case that came to us from the Pentagon and from what were really higher-ups in the Army. Uh, and it was very exciting, but it was rather intimidating in that, what did I know? I was a one-year yeah, trainee. It was good training because you get back to Washington later, but I'll get there. <laughs> so then you go back to Brooklyn. Right. You finish Kings County. Right. And then... The guy who served people really wants to, you, you, you continue at, at Downstate, but you also open up a practice. You're on the faculty of Downstate, right? I went, to, I, I finished my residency, I did a research fellowship, and started psychoanalytic training, and I started a practice. I was very busy. Uh, I was running very long days and nights, but I really, uh, I just liked it, and then I, I put it all behind me. And then I started as an uh, academic on the Downstate Department, uh, and I had a kind of quick rise there. So I was chairing the department at 37. And I had... and then you decide, hey, you know, I don't know how somebody gets to Colorado. You know, you never <laughs> saw Colorado. You, you're chairing the department uh, at 37, and you pick up the family, and you move to where? Denver, Colorado. So the issue was that I had a lot of fun. Cal Plimpton was the president of Downstate at the time. And after I had used whatever resources they had given me to start with, I went to Cal. I said, I need me more resources. I want to build the department further. I would recruited a lot of people. We were doing well. He said, well, right now we have to pay attention to medicine and surgery. We don't have any more resources to give psychiatry. At the same time, a friend of mine comes from Colorado and says, would you consider making a lateral move to Denver? I said, not, not in your wildest dreams, but come out to give a talk. I come out to give a talk. And they said, why don't you bring your family out here? Well, and they, I come out with my family, and we're seeing all these beautiful hills and mountains, and they kind of dazzle us. And then the dean tells me, I'll give you 18 faculty positions you can recruit to. 18 faculty positions? That's like putting your, a, a whole new department together. So long and short, I decide with my wife and then three children, we're going to Colorado, and my friends think I'm out of my mind. So I remember getting into the car, in Brooklyn, ready to go, packed up, and my friends looking at me, shaking their heads, the guy's, the guy's off his rocker. And off we went for a little adventure in Colorado. How many years? Three. And then Washington? Well, what happened is, what was very important to the psychiatry department was the National Institute of Mental Health. That's where a lot of the money came from, and I didn't like what they were doing. I felt that they were not professional. I felt that they were not paying attention to the major psychiatric disorders. And I didn't like it. I mouthed off about it. So then somebody said, OK, since they're kicking out the NIMH director, somebody's got to do it. So I thought other people who'd been around much longer than me would do it. Nobody wanted to do it. I have a, a this, a loan, a this, a that. I said, well, somebody's got to do it. If it comes to it, I'll do it. I put my mouth, I, I, I spoke up. So you, back, you, All of a sudden, so you go Washington. back to Washington right. now, and you spend how many, now, you start with one administration, as you said, because uh, Rosalind Carter right. really cared about mental health. It was her we, number we, one We priority. won't talk about the Reagans later on. They had the problem with mental health. But uh, you spent how many years over there in Washington? Five and a half years. We came there in September of 78, uh, and I left there in uh, early 84. But you really grew something. I mean, uh, 
you built a major department. Well, I, uh, I Large frankly budget and loved the NIMH. Um, it was fascinating. And, and for anybody to spend some time in Washington is useful because you get to know how policy is made and how that place works. And so it, it, it became less of a mystery to me. But in the process, you meet people who are interested in mental health. You meet people who are interested in government. You meet leaders from all over. And the process of government and politics always fascinated me. So I frankly loved it. And we worked on a new mental health program, which was going to help underserved populations, minorities, older people, children, because they weren't well served by the existing law. And the amazing thing was we worked on it uh, for three years, got it passed. Kennedy was there when we celebrated its passage. And then in came Reagan, and it was, it was dust within no time. So then you said, hey, enough, enough of this, Washington. I, I want to become a dean. Now, and, and no, wait, the Bronx, Lakewood, Brooklyn, Denver, Washington. You now, ret now you go to Washington Heights, something different. You go to Washington Heights to the, to, I mean, th this is interesting. You know, a downstate graduate, as you said, to, to be the dean of Columbia University? Columbia School of Physicians and Surgeons, one of the first medical schools in the country. How'd that happen? Well, first of all, I stayed for three years of Reagan because I felt I wanted to do whatever I could to protect the National Institute of Mental Health. And we had some success in that regard. And I was there for a few years, but then I found that they weren't going to do much of what I wanted. And I thought I could do better to go on the outside and try to work on mental health from outside. So I looked around. Where would I be most interested in going? Well, in my mind, the, 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 the place with the, the potential to have the best department of psychiatry in the country was Columbia. And long and short of a wonderful friend of mine, Bob Levy, who had been the head of the National Heart and Lung Disease, was the one who helped recruit me there with Don Tapley, who was the dean. I wound up there first as chair of psychiatry. Uh, we have the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Right next Columbia, door. Right. Which is uh, an integral part of the program. And it's a marvelous, it's a, it's a marvelous demonstration of New York. New York, really, whatever you say about it, there's a lot good to say about it. But one of the things is New York's philosophy, really, is responsiveness to people in need. And it would be classic for New York to have a major psychiatric institute to work on psychiatric disorders. So I went there to run that institute, run the Department of Psychiatry. And after being in that position for about five years, <clears throat> I was considering a position I was being offered at one of the other medical centers in town, when they came and said, why don't you stay and be the dean? So, but you, you remain dean and also the heads of the Department of Psychiatry. Right. And, but what people don't realize is that the dean of Columbia University the College of Physicians and Surgeons also encompasses the School of Dentistry, the School of Mental Health. Right, you have two positions. You're dean of the College of Medicine, and then there are other three deans of health schools. And, and you are also given the position of vice president, so you oversee those four schools as, re as well as running one. And I had three excellent colleagues and had fun. But really, the other three schools uh, were, had such talented leadership that they ran themselves. My work was really in the medical school, but working collaboratively with the other partners in public health, dentistry, and nursing. Right, but let, you know, here's the interesting thing. You're at Columbia. Now, you were, you were at Presbyterian as the, the head of the department. And at that time, Presbyterian was a different Presbyterian. I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't, I mean, right now, New York Presbyterian healthcare system uh, is two hospitals, the University Hospital of Columbia University and also the Weill Medical Center. You know, and there were two different campuses. But it was, you know, that was a, an area of transition. You right, know, absolutely. Uh, it was a total area transition of at least 50, 60 percent was probably charity cases based on, uh, on the neighborhood. And, and the, the institution, as you said, when we met last week, was, was really losing $50 million a year. At one point, it lost up to $50 million. It was really in very dangerous shape. And um, that preceded me. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 you're right in the sense that uh, Presbyterian Hospital has an enormous uh, service responsibility and still does today. Uh, still with a lot of people, tremendous number of people who are under, uh, don't have, have minimal resources. Um, but uh, Presbyterian had a long, good tradition, excellent clinical training, some of what I would construe as the very best doctors you can find anywhere. They are just wonderful. The medical students they draw are terrific. The residents they draw 
the people there are superb. Now, while you're the dean and the head of psychiatrists, you, you get into your first building, even though you're not a builder. You built the psychiatric building, the new psychiatric uh, center. Right. Well, there were some people who played an important I, role I in agree, that. but, you know. And, and, and the people who were particularly, was somebody we lost, uh, a spectacular individual, Bill Modell, from Modell Sports Shops and his wife, Shelby. And they're a wonderful family, good friends, and they helped me politically because Shelby knows everybody and has helped everybody. And so they were critical in helping uh, to develop this new building. And Governor Cuomo was then uh, in, in uh, position as governor. Uh, and little by little, we were able to get people to come on board to build us a whole new psychiatric research institute. Now, in the mid-90s, it was a time that institutions were merging, you know, Sinai and NYU, but you were the, you were the forerunner, okay? Uh, Skinner and Speck over there decide to merge the, the Presbyterian Hospital with the New York Hospital. Uh, what happens? There were a lot of very important people involved in that, and really spectacular human beings in, in our city and state. Uh, John Mack, Frank Bennick, John McGillicuddy, uh, Dan Burke, you can't find better than that. <clears throat> and they worked with Speck and, and uh, uh, Skinner to make a very uh, kind of courageous decision. Take these two major hospitals and make one larger one. You'll get savings administratively. You'll create a more potent structure. You'll have best practices shared between the two institutions. And it worked. And they, they, they deserve the credit. For, for this idea. Right, and, and during that administration, they started on the, as you would say, the, the east side campus, I mean east side, your west side. The east side campus, they, they built the entire new Greenberg building. Uh, well, Green, Hank Greenberg, Hank Greenberg The Greenberg Hospital. He, he had done that even before. I mean, you know, there's so many good people in this. Hank Greenberg is probably the, one of the smartest men, if not the smartest man I've ever met, and a spectacularly philanthropic. Uh, and so Hank had, with David Skinner, and a lot of supporting people like Ron Stanton and others built the new Greenberg Pavilion, which is arguably uh, one of the best hospital buildings in the world. Uh, Hank was devoted to New is devoted to New York Hospital. Uh, as you know, he helps all kinds of uh, enterprises. Uh, and these other, the, the, the then leading trustees I mentioned, uh, the two boards, decided to put it together. New York Hospital at one point was losing $50 million a year, and it was Hank and Dave Skinner who combined to bring that down. The question was, could you take hospitals, which had been losing that much money, then got better, they got to the point where they're having kind of balanced budgets, and then could you take it and make it move? And by, by making this merger happen, they gave us the framework which enabled us to really move the hospital forward. So now it's, it's December of 1999, you know, Y2K, uh, you know, right. just like Y2K. And, and you know, the dean, uh, the vice president, the Department of Psychiatry is offered the opportunity on like December 15th to become the president of this mega, mega system. Right. What was that like? I mean, well, uh, the reason I did that is because it was not a secret that uh, as the dean of the medical school, I didn't always agree with uh, the hospital administration. And so one way I could do it is maybe I could create a better uh, collaboration by going over to, to run the hospital. And the reason that it was not my idea, but f first was one of the uh, trustees at uh, New York Hospital, in fact, who approached me. And then the, trust, the search committee talked to me whether I'd be interested. Uh, and I talked to the then president of Columbia, George Rupp, and some of the uh, trustees. Uh, Steve uh, Friedman was there, Dave Stern was there, Al Lerner was still alive in those days. And I asked their opinion, what do you think, would this be a good idea for me to do? And they gradually they came, yep, maybe this would be good because we'd had our tensions with the hospital, and if I went over there, maybe I could make it more collaborative. So w something a little crazy on my part, Without taking a break, in two weeks, I went from head of the medical school and the other schools to president of the hospital. And now you became a builder. Right. Now, I, I mean, it's in, okay, it's eight years now. In the last seven years, uh, this, the, the system has been distinguished as one of the top hospitals seven consec consecutive years. But there have been a lot of building. You know, and, and I think some of the notable building, let's take the West Side campus first. Right. Uh, I mean... There were very few children's hospitals, and 
you know, do, and you know, probably when your father used to teach you and your sister and your brother how to go after and give money to charitable causes, it, it helped you to fundraise. So you get Morgan Stanley to help them build a... a well, other people have no, noticed I mean, that we, already. Other people, but, but the credit goes there to John Mack, Cynthia Sparrow as the executive director of the uh, Children's Hospital. Bill Speck had started the idea, uh, but Morgan Stanley really came on and gave an enormous gift of some $65 million to launch this children's hospital, which is spectacular. Uh, and uh, we put that up. We then did other projects there. We wanted to uh, modernize all the inpatient units, create a special unit where uh, young kids could come and not have to stay overnight and have their uh, procedures. Right, but then in addition to the children's hospital, uh, the, uh, the Berry building, right. the Diabetes Center, which is what? The, Ber the Berry Center came about because Russ Berry, who was a toy manufacturer in New Jersey, um, had uh, diabetes, his mother had di died of diabetes, and uh, I was told that you couldn't get good diabetes care in New York, which astonished me. I don't see how you can say you can't get good diabetes care in New York. Well, everybody was going up to Boston, not everybody, a lot of people who could go there were going up to Boston for their care. Long and short, we found Russ. We negotiated a deal, and he helped us put up a building and the Naomi Berry uh, Diabetes Center, and also put a primary care clinic downstairs for the community. Right, and then also on the west side, the Irving Cancer Center. The Irving Cancer Center was something which I started, but really it was completed under the uh, direction of the subsequent dean, uh, Jerry Fishback. But Herb Irving is the key person here, because Herb Irving is arguably one of the most philanthropic men in the country. Uh, and he loves the institution. He and Florence are spectacular, and they've helped build the clinical research center. They helped build a clinical research program. They helped build the cancer program, inpatient, outpatient, research. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Milsteins with the new heart center. Absolutely. That's the other family. If you Milsteins and the Irvings are two of the key families in the whole story of Columbia Presbyterian. Seymour and Paul took over leadership of the board of the, of the hospital. It was at a time when it was very difficult, and they helped bring it back to success with Bill Speck as the president. So they brought it back from really uh, the cliff, if you will. And then Seymour helped philanthropically the whole family. That's Vivian, his wife, and Philip, and, and right. Connie. They then said, we want to do this heart center. Now, since I only have a minute, I have to go quickly on the east side. On the east side, uh, thank God for Hank Greenberg Absolutely. and, and uh, Ron Stanton. Uh, Stanton and Weil for the, the new clinical building on 70th Street and York Avenue. Right. Uh, then you're, now you have a cogeneration plant co also being done. Cogeneration plant going up. And, uh, First in, Avenue building, residential right, building. Uh, the top, uh, which we've discussed in the other show, the need for uh, residency. You're opening up this magnificent uh, campus over there, uh, right. a new building at 72nd Street and 1st Avenue. New You're, 14th floor with the new amenities unit. It'll be the best in the country. Right, and then a blood center? Uh, exa expanded blood bank, a new uh, expanded emergency room that Lisa and Richard Perry have helped with, uh, new intensive care units, new hospital beds. Uh, we are very proud to be able to help people. And the, the news is out, so everybody wants to come there. We want to accommodate them. You know, for, for the kid who grew up in the Bronx, who ended up in Lakewood, who ended up in New Brunswick, you have truly, due to yourself, due to the trustees, to the people who have helped philanthropy, you've built and you've been a builder of New York. I'd like to thank you for being here today. Uh, you're very sweet. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig, Allied Partners. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman & Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, 
Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Meriden Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sheldrake Organization, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Triangle Services, Whitcoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction.